Hi, I'm Brittany. And I'm Cami. And this is the Deeply Rooted Homeschool. The heart behind this podcast is to encourage and equip you as you start or continue your homeschool journey. If you are considering homeschooling or are new to homeschooling, we created this podcast with you in mind to answer common questions. If you're just finding us, you'll want to go back and catch up on our past episodes. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to today's episode. Today, we are thrilled to have two guests with us, our friends, Alisanne and Melissa. Alisanne and I have known each other for almost a decade. We met through a mutual friend, and then our families got to know each other through church. She was the first friend in my adult life that I knew who was homeschooling, and she kept encouraging me to come along with her on that journey. Now, we're both homeschooling. We're a part of the same co-op. Um, Alisanne is married and has four kids, ranging from ages 13 to 3. She's also a registered nurse who has worked in various capacities over the years to make the homeschool life work for their family. I'm always amazed at how capable she is of guiding her children in everything that they do. Allison, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I love that you guys are providing this resource for families. Will you tell us a little bit more about your family, Allison? As you said, I have four kids, two girls and two boys. My youngest turned three a couple of weeks ago and my oldest is starting seventh grade. This will be our eighth year to homeschool. My husband and I have been married for 16 years. He works doing data for an insurance company. I am a nurse who's worked in the PICU, NICU, and is a clinical instructor for a local college. I have been home full time for six years. We also have my good friend, Melissa Tyler. Melissa was one of my first friends when I moved to town. I met her when she was pregnant with her first baby. From then on, I have looked up to her in all things. She's wise, generous, fun, and is currently hating that I'm saying all these nice things about her. She's the most selfless person I've ever met. She was also one of the first homeschool moms I knew. She noticed her family needed something different, and she worked hard to make it work. She's also always been a working mom while homeschooling her four kids. Welcome, Melissa. Could you tell us a little bit more about your family? Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm so humbled to even be invited to speak. Um, Yes, uh, so I have four children, and they range in age from 5 to 10, almost 11. Um, I have one girl and three boys, and um, they keep me very busy. (laughs) Um, I'm a nurse uh, care manager currently at a local office. Um, I work 26 hours in clinic and then take call um, during the after hours when the clinic is closed. I've also been a NICU nurse um, previously as well. Um, We've homeschooled since my oldest started school, so that's going on six years, and we've never done a co-op. Okay, so one of the things I've known about you, Melissa, is that when something isn't working, you figure it out and you change it. Can you give us an example of a particular time in your homeschool journey that you had to do that, and how did you respond? So my background is in nursing. It's not in teaching. And when I began homeschooling, it seemed like things were flowing well. I started to notice, though, in the first grade that my oldest was kind of lagging some and started to question whether or not my teaching was what she needed it to be. It wasn't until a friend younger than her came over and was able to read something that she recognized she herself was not able to read that I really started um, digging deep and trying to figure out what was going on. So I pursued um, a network of people around me that knew more than I did about teaching and dyslexia and various things and came to find out that she was a dyslexic. So we moved from the current curriculum that we were on to um, all about spelling and all about reading, which are two curriculums that have been developed by a dyslexic mom for her child. And we started doing those. Um, More recently, though, we've noticed that while we did make strides that uh, there was still more ground to be gained and that we ended up switching to connections curriculum, which we're going to be starting this next school year. So stay posted on that. But, um, but yes, that is a definitely a time that we had to move and do something different than even the people around me that were currently around me at the time were doing. So I love that what you're saying is it wasn't just a little thing. It wasn't just, oh, this isn't working. Because I've had, you know, one of my kids, their curriculum wasn't working for them. And so we switched it mid-semester, did a different one, smooth sailing. And what you're saying is you noticed something pretty significant. And you you switched everything up. And here, you know, a few years later, you're realizing 
it, it's not enough. It's not, it's not enough for what you want for your daughter. So you're here. You are again, same issue, maybe a little bit different struggle, and you're you're starting something totally different. And I think a lot of people are going to need to hear that because it's not it's not easy. It's it's rarely ever easy. So um, okay, Allison, have you ever come against up against something in your homeschool that wasn't working, and what did you do? We make changes every year, but last year I really lost control of our schedule. It was our most stressful year so far. It started with my youngest needing speech therapy, which then led to OT and then PT. And that included some additional appointments in Little Rock plus the normal checkups we all take our kids to. Each time we added a therapy, I had to adjust our schedule. School was often done on the go in the car in waiting areas. Doing school this way did not work well for our family. I have two kids who are also um, dyslexic, and we too are changing. We had a similar experience to Melissa with one of our daughters. It was just reading was not clicking despite her having normal intelligence and being a very quick thinker. So we too switched to a different reading curriculum and made some progress, but then we just in the last year have plateaued, and that's when we decided we needed to seek a professional help and a different direction. And so we have been working with a tutor and we are also doing a dyslexic curriculum with our tutor. When we have to make changes, our family tries to operate in a what we call the two degree turn principle. My husband uses the analogy that our family is a train and if you turn it sharply, you will flip it. So unless God is calling us to do a 180, we look for ways we can make small, helpful changes that cause the least disruption and fallout. We're staying in our co-op, but we're adapting and changing the way we present and teach the information at home. So, Allison, you mentioned that you were using a different curriculum, but you're switching curriculums this year. Uh, Can you tell us what curriculum you were using and what you're switching to with your children with dyslexia? We were using All About Reading and All About Spelling, and like I said, we did see some improvement there, but then she just needed more. And so we're using a combination of Connections, Hegarty, and DuBard method with our tutor at home. And how often does your tutor come to your house? We have been doing twice a week this summer, but with two kids needing her, we are now doing once a week for each kid. So, so many listeners have asked us about homeschooling children with different abilities. I've had a lot of people say, I wish I could homeschool my child, but she has moderate dyslexia and I don't think I'm the best teacher for her, or I don't feel qualified to do that. Maybe their child um, benefits from OT or PT or speech therapy, and they know that they can get them at a public school. Uh, So they want to homeschool, but for logistics, they're nervous about homeschooling instead of putting them in a school system. Since we know both of you guys well, uh, we know that both of you have a little bit of experience with some of these things as parents. What would you say to somebody who said that to you, that they don't feel qualified to teach their children at home because of their child's particular needs? I feel this way a lot of days. I have to remind myself that what God has called me to, He will be faithful to finish. And this is not a one-time thing. This is a daily exercise for me. Sometimes I get so overwhelmed. I think I cannot do this all. And I'm letting so many pieces fall through the cracks. My friend Shannon gave me some good advice recently related to this. And the first thing she said was that you and your spouse have to determine the non-negotiables for your family. And maybe ask yourself, does homeschooling fit these non-negotiables? And then you've got to put boundaries around these non-negotiables. Boundaries are God's gift to us. We find them in our world and in Scripture. They keep God first, and they allow for margin. Boundaries plus limits equal margin, and we all need margin. The other thing I would say is to set realistic expectations for your kids. Focus on progress, not performance, and don't constantly compare. This is important with any kid, but especially when they, you have these added disabilities. Implement structure over perfection. Be willing to adjust. For example, 
I am planning three weeks at a time this year so that I am constantly evaluating our progress and where we may need to go back and where we may need to change. Allow time for interruptions. Along with delays and learning disabilities, you also often have anxiety, sensory, or other behavior challenges that need accommodation during your school day. And ask for help. I felt lost and overwhelmed when I first read the academic testing reports. We had worked hard and we were falling well below the bar. A two degree turn for our family was that we began meeting with a tutor that works with our kids and also teaches me and helps me to plan on what to work on during the week. This does not come without a cost. And I think this is important to say because it requires sacrifice. It's another area where you and your spouse have to prioritize together what's important to you and how you can accommodate. And then beyond that, we just have to trust that God provides for all of our needs, including our academic ones. And the last thing I would say is that you just have to filter all advice through your God-given intuition because no two families or two children are the same. I really like all those things that you said, Alsan. Um, implement structure over perfection is such a good thing. I think that's that's important no matter who you're talking about when you're homeschooling because really there is no such thing as perfection. And it's only going to frustrate everybody if you're trying for perfection. But especially, like you said, if you have kids with sensory needs or things like that. So, Melissa, what would you say? Well, I can um, basically echo everything that Alison just said. Um, I can 100% relate to the not feeling qualified, and um, I still wrestle with this from time to time. But um, I always have to go back to my why. Why am I homeschooling? Like, what is my goal in homeschooling? Um, for our family, it was that God, our God-centered prompting to um, do this for our family. And initially, it was not clear why we were felt so strongly we needed to homeschool. Um, my husband was not homeschooled. I was not homeschooled. I never even thought I would have four children. So the fact that I have four children and I'm homeschooling is, um, if you told me that in high school, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, but um, as the years have gone by and we've discovered that um, we have a dyslexic, we have a um, high functioning autistic and ADHD child. And then we also have a child with verbal apraxia. It's become more and more apparent as to why God has called us to this journey. Um, I've had teacher after teacher tell me that the one-on-one -on -one attention that we give our kids, whether we are um, proficiently trained in their special education needs or not, is just incredibly valuable because we see them as who they are. We know them inside and out being their parents and we are able to see their strengths and weaknesses in a way that a public school system just may not be able to. Um, not because teachers are not willing or amazing because they are, but more because they have so many children to look after and because they just simply can't know your kids the way that you do. So one of the things that I try to do is to really combat the lies that the enemy speaks over me with biblical truth. Um, I just have to trust that the Lord has given me and trusted me with my children, that I'm not out there on my own, but that he has given them to me to raise alongside him and that he's not going to leave me to do it on my own. And that worry really does not accomplish all that much. Um, like I said, I have a dyslexic and autistic and a verbal apraxia child and, um, they all require different learning needs. Um, in fact, I was even reading a book on dyslexia recently, and it talks about how the brain is formed. And it is exactly the opposite of the way the autistic brain is formed. And in that moment, when I read that sentence, the thought went through my head, Lord, what are you doing to me? <laughs> but honestly, it's that it's just that we as parents are also being raised up and stretched and molded to further fit his image. And this is just one of the ways that the Lord keeps me on my knees. My personality is very much uh, take charge, trying to get it done myself within my own strength. And I know that the Lord uses my children to just grow me closer to him, too. That it's not all about their growth, but it's about my growth as well. Um, I also rest on the fact that if we pray and ask for wisdom, that the Bible says that he will give it to us. And that good character, a hard work ethic, and the favor of the Lord will go further in this world 
than any achievement at an Ivy League education or anything like that will. Um, We are looking for our kids to achieve eternal things here in their time on this earth. So for someone like me, that brings me so much peace and so much uh, rest to my soul to know that we are teaching and training their character in the ways that the Lord's asked us to, and that that's where my responsibility um, is most valued. Um, Education is important, don't get me wrong. Um, And I fully feel the weight of that responsibility. But uh, I know that having children who seek and pursue the Lord is my ultimate goal. I would also agree with Alisanne that comparison is um, not wise. In fact, the Bible even says those who compare themselves with themselves are not wise. I think that there is a time to look and see that your child may need help in a different area, but at the same time, your child's strengths and gifts are not going to be the strengths and gifts of other children. And for that matter, your child's strengths and gifts are not going to be your strengths and gifts. I feel like in school, education was fairly easy for me. A plus B equals C. I put in the work and I got the grade. With my children, they can put in the work, but they don't always get the grade. And so I've learned to applaud their efforts and encourage their hard work and to, like Alisanne said, look for the progress over the perfection. Lastly, I would say to find a core group of friends or people that you can be real and vulnerable with who will just remind you of those biblical truths and who will encourage you when you're struggling and who will help you to see the fruits of your efforts because sometimes it's hard to see it yourself and having that community around you to lift you up in those moments is just so vital. And uh, I know Allison has been one of those people for me and I'm so grateful for her. So I agree with that 100%. And I think that not only having a core group of people that are encouraging you as a mom, but other adults around you that love your kids and will cheer them on. And I know, I mean, I have two kids with very different sensory needs. And I have found several other moms who just love them where they are and will direct them and help help what I'm trying to do at home as well. So I feel like that's really important. Okay. And so, Melissa, I know that you and I have had a conversation off mic about um, just the sensory needs that your kids have and my kids have as well. And I know that sometimes that makes school look a little bit different at our house. Sometimes we're doing cartwheels while we're doing spelling words. So can you maybe talk to us a little bit about what that looks like at your house? Sure. Um, Some days school is done sitting on an an exercise ball bouncing up and down um, and then sliding off the ball under the table to run out of the room while I'm calling them back and saying, no, no, next word, next word. Um, Sometimes school is done um, with my other three children in a separate room with the door closed while my autistic child has um, those yoga floor mats interlocked together on three three sides all around him to block out any distraction with a noisemaker on because he says the sound is too loud in our house and he can't focus. Um, sometimes, um, that means that we're in the middle of reading history and he is walking around the kitchen, pacing and hand flapping and rocking and chewing on his chewy while he listens. And so, um, yes, sensory needs are definitely a big part of our school day. And sometimes our sensory needs will cause us to not finish our school day, which, um, we've also had to learn along over time. We've learned to just let it roll over to the next day or let it roll over to the next time or maybe it's not so relevant that they know this one paragraph that's left in history for the day and we'll just move on to what's new tomorrow. Just accepting that that's okay is a big deal. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There's definitely challenges with that and you just have to prioritize what's best for your child. And sometimes finishing the lesson is not as important as meeting the sensory need because otherwise you're going to deal with a huge meltdown for the next hour versus just taking your 15 minutes to do your sensory stuff or just delaying a lesson or whatnot. And I know that every kid's sensory needs are different. Some are sensory seekers, some are sensory avoiders, and I know that that's going to look different not only just family to family, but child to child. And those resources can be hard to come by at times. So if you suspect your child has a sensory need, um, I would recommend trying to get a test, uh, you know, getting them tested or evaled at um, a therapy center or something for OT or PT or speech. Those um, members of our team have just been so valuable to our home life, to our kids' development, to, um, 
it's they're just amazing, amazing individuals with amazing gifts, and they've just turned our lives um, right side up in many ways. That is so good. So helpful. Oh my goodness. Okay. So Melissa, switching gears a little bit, you work pretty much full time and then homeschool your kids. You have so many things going on, but you manage them all with grace. I know you have a pretty structured week and homeschool. Can you tell us a little bit about what your week looks like and how you keep all of the plates spinning? So I really value structure and schedule, which works really well with my autistic child. Um, And some people would probably think that I'm, if they looked at my schedule, would probably think that I'm a crazy drill sergeant. But I promise this just brings me so much peace to have everything scheduled. So, um, but I schedule everything. The first... um, The first thing that we look at is our things that are uh, non-negotiables, kind of like Allison was talking about earlier. Um, So we have, I have to go to work. So we have work um, two days a week, I work, and then uh, two full 12 hour days. Then um, I also um, have therapy two days a week and therapies, some of them butt up together, like two of my children are in therapy. So some of their therapies butt up together and then some of them don't. So um, we put those on the calendar next. Um, then I look at our homeschooling day and I schedule that in. And I learned pretty early on that you really have to protect that time that you homeschool your kids because there are so many really good things that will come up, but they're not all things that you should do. (laughs) So, cause if you take part in all the good things, sometimes the necessary things don't get done. So I always put our homeschooling stuff on the calendar next. Then after that is when I look at, um, our, home life. So our chores, are we getting things done because nobody wants to play date with someone who hasn't showered in two weeks and doesn't brush their teeth. So I try to make sure that all of our, um, home stuff is done. So, uh, we'll even schedule our chores. So, um, everybody in our house has a laundry day. They wash their laundry. My kids, even my five-year-old washes their own laundry and folds it and puts it away. Um, your kids are not too young to learn to do things. I will say they can do more than you think. And it is so helpful when your schedule is so full and it's good for them. So, um, but we have, um, all of our chores scheduled. And then beyond that, that's when we schedule our social events and our hangouts with friends and such. So, um, so it's pretty full and we, we average probably somewhere between around five hours. Um, I allow, try to schedule in for school each day. It's not that it totally takes the five hours, but like, uh, Alison was mentioning before, we have to schedule in margin because you never know when a sensory need is going to come up or when someone's just going to have a regular old meltdown over math or whatnot. Um, so we have to schedule margin within our day, or I end up being even more frustrated and even more, cause I'm like, no, we got to stick to the schedule. So, um, I have to allow that for myself to just so that we can all, uh, give each other grace throughout the day. That's really helpful. That was, that's really great. Um, okay. Allison, would you mind sharing what your week looks like during a typical school season and how do you keep all your people moving through their schoolwork? I completely lost control of that last year. It was new to us to have so many appointments during the week. And so Melissa has actually been a mentor to me in getting back to a place of peace and structured. And so I have a plan I can share with you guys. The reality of this working is to be determined, but on Monday we will go to co-op and then on Tuesday we have school and we have nothing else. We will probably have preschool for our three-year-old. Then on Wednesday and Thursday we have school in the morning and therapy in the afternoons. And on Friday, we have school in the morning, and then we meet with our tutor in the afternoon, and we're pairing that with doing some science with friends. We are making some changes with our school year because we, as I said before, discovered that our special needs learners do not do well without the structure and the set time. The pressure to get done fast before you have to get to an appointment or the interruption that an appointment caused brought a lot of turmoil and stole a lot of peace and joy from our homeschool last year. My husband lends a hand when he can, but during the normal circumstances, he is works in another city during the day. So a a two degree turn we have implemented is that I have a high school or homeschool student who will come two hours a day, two to three days a week that she's just going to help with continuity for our school day. 
So when I have to leave to take someone to an appointment or to therapy, we're not losing 30, 40 minutes while I'm driving back and forth. Our, my plan is that she will be able to keep them on task and still going and so that we do have that time during the day that we are allowing for those interruptions. And I also want to add that homeschooling doesn't always have to be done at home. Uh, for a period of time there when I had two children in therapy for an hour and a half every Tuesday and Thursday morning with my other two more traditional learners, um, or I guess non-special needs learners, um, I was able to do school with them in the lobby of the therapy place. Um, so we just pulled up the little side tables and pulled out our books out of the backpack and we went through flashcards and they did some assignments there. And that helped us to utilize our time well so that we weren't sitting in a lobby board and then we went home and did school and then we had no time for friends. So um, because they were, and they were motivated by the fact that if they got their schoolwork done in that environment, we did have more time for play dates. But I think it depends on your child and what distractions they're able to tolerate and where they're able to learn. But um, we've done it in the car before as well when we were waiting for different things. We've laid down the seats in the back of our car and spread out like a floor and just done homeschooling back there as well. Those are all really great points. Um, thank you guys both for sharing all those things with us. One thing that we always ask everybody is what your favorite school supply is. I would like to hear from both of y'all what your favorite school supply might be. Or even in y'all's case, I mean, if you're, you're talking about um, the mats that your son was using to build a little shield around himself, tell us about your favorite things that you need in your life to keep your homeschool rolling. So as far as our day-to-day -day homeschool goes, um, mine are not brands or anything in particular, but I really love the little sticky notes that save my page <laughs> because trying to flip through a book and find where we last were is... Um, hard. And then we use my father's world curriculum and they tend to jump around a lot. So a lot of times if I can have the pages marked ahead of time, it just makes things go smoother. Um, and then I also really like dry erase boards because they just save paper and we can erase mistakes really easily without tearing up our paper. And, um, I don't know, they're just, they just work well for us. And then as, um, just a homeschool mom resource, um, teaching from rest, which I know has been recommended several times on this podcast already. Um, it it's just such a good book to, um, help your heart with that, that whole qualified, am I qualified to teach my child thing? Um, it just will give you so much peace and insight into why God has called you to play the role in your child's life that he has. So my favorite homeschool resource is probably YouTube. If we're stressed, I can use it to pull up a hymn, and that just seems to calm everyone down. If someone wants to know more about something we read in science, I can usually find a good video. It just It's a world of information that I can easily type into my phone. Well, thank you guys both so much for being with us today and for talking about all these things that um, so many people really do struggle with. And I just thank you for being honest and vulnerable with us today and all of our listeners that are thinking about homeschooling their children, and especially if they have special needs. Um, Brittany, would you mind to pray us out? Sure. Lord, thank you for these ladies that joined us today. Thank you for their wisdom and transparency. I pray that you would reach through these mics and bless everyone who's listening and in need of their encouragement, that it would penetrate their hearts and minds and allow them to just take a deep breath and trust that the one who made them and their babies is the one who will carry them through. Lord, I pray that you would bless both Alice Ann and Melissa. I pray for breakthroughs, for supernatural strength, wisdom, and energy, and that you would show your glory through their families and homeschool. I ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you were blessed and encouraged by today's episode. Make sure you check the show notes for links to everything that we talked about in today's episode. And make sure you check us out on social media at the Deeply Rooted Homeschool.